So you have to make up your mind whether you want to enter a truthful area of life and begin to see where truth must begin to break down all your alibis, all your fears, all your runnings away. You must decide whether you want to enter, enter the battle, the royal battle, the right battle, or whether you want to hide and run away and continue to live as you've lived up to now, which is a pretty dreadful life, and you know it. From this point on, then, no excuses, only facing the fact of what you presently are. Can you start with that? Face the facts of what you presently are and see what is the result of that. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. There's an airplane flying over the Sahara Desert with 10 passengers in it and a pilot. And right over the center of the Sahara Desert, one of the two engines gave out, sputtered, and the propeller stopped. And the pilot gave a warning to the passengers to fasten their seat belts, which they did. The plane went on. The other motor went out. The plane went down. Came down to a pretty rough landing, which didn't injure anyone, but it destroyed the plane's possibility for taking off again. So all the passengers got out, grateful that they hadn't been hurt seriously. When they got out, the pilot told them that the radio had been injured, so there was no way to communicate with the base. So they all got out of the plane, and as they did, they discovered a curious thing. They couldn't understand each other because they all spoke a different language. Every one of them spoke a different tongue, and they couldn't communicate with each other. However, they all knew they were in a hazardous spot, so out of the 10 passengers, one of them said by gestures and nodding, and remember, they couldn't communicate. And I've described human beings. There's no real communication between people. There's only, there's only what you want, huh? And your reaction of anger when you don't get it. So they get out of the plane, and one of the men who had been a leader in business and social affairs made his motions, gestured to the others, Come on, I know the way out. There's a village over and toward the west. Follow me and we'll find it and be rescued and send back help for the other. So two or three of them said, okay, uh, by just sign language, we'll go with you. So they started to leave and the, the pilot tried to stop them, but they wouldn't pay any attention because they were desperate people. They were afraid of what was going to happen to them if they stayed out there too long without food and water. So they started out. And they were gone for a half a day. And at the end of this half a day, when they came back, they came to a ridge. And they looked over the ridge. And down in front of it was the plane. They'd made a circle. And unknowingly, had circled all around the desert and came right back where they started. A second group started out. They went out into a sandstorm. They followed, they, they followed the leader. And the sandstorm drove them back. And they came back, and listen to this, please. They came back very angry at the leader, the man that they had placed their hope in just a little bit before. They were now cursing him, cursing the man who was going to rescue them. Because they said, it was your fault that we ran into the sandstorm and had to come back right where we started. So this went on for a while. They all went out a little bit from the plane and followed the leader, and they all came back all discouraged, and all this time the pilot was trying to tell them as best he could, don't go out there, it's dangerous, there's no point in it, but they couldn't listen. Finally, all ten of them were absent from the plane at once. They'd gone in their different directions. And when they came back, they were shocked at what they saw. And what they saw was no pilot. And at first they thought, well, maybe he's taken all the food and water and taken off for himself. He has some secret map or something. So they searched the plane. All the water and food was there. So they didn't know what to think. Here was the pilot gone. They didn't see uh, footprints leading away from the airplane anywhere. And they were they were both hopeful and confused because if he had found the way out, maybe they could 
But what was it? And they didn't know the answer to that. So with the pilot gone, they continued to wander around the plane, trying to figure out among themselves, not communicating right with each other, of course, because they couldn't understand each other, tried to figure out what they should do. And they didn't come to an answer. Now, I'll tell you what happened to the pilot. He stayed at the plane while the others were gone. And after a short time, a helicopter came down, landed, picked him up, and took him away. And on the way back in the rescuing plane, the pilot of the helicopter and the pilot of the downed airplane had a conversation. And the pilot of the plane said, I tried to tell those people to stay at the plane like I did, and they would have been rescued too, but they wouldn't listen to me. They insisted on finding the way out for themselves. And the helicopter pilot said, yes, this is the way it happens quite frequently. However, we will keep going back and forth over the area and eventually maybe pick them up if they come back to the airplane. So that was that. Now back to the 10 men back at the airplane. After two or three days, one of the men began to get a certain understanding. Here he was way out a couple miles from the air, and having followed about the fifth or sixth so-called leader to find the way back. And I want you to listen very carefully now to what I'm going to say. This is very hard of what we're talking about tonight. A certain understanding came to him after getting all that sand in his shoes and the heat in his head and all the discouragement and fear that he was going to be lost out out there, a certain understanding came to him. And here's what it was. Now make this application now. The first thing he understood was that there were some things that he could think about. And there were other things that he couldn't think about. All right, let's break it down. Here's this man wandering out in the desert, having followed other people, now, what's there to think about? The only thing he can think about is the fact that he's lost. He can run his thoughts around on that. He can see his actual condition. He can, know, listen, he can know that he doesn't know where to go. That's what he can think about. He can see there's no point doing what he has been doing the last day or two, which is following other, uh, other so-called leaders because they led him out in the sandstorm and led him in circles. He can, he can think of simply about the fact of his actual condition and nothing else. He understood that. That's what he could ponder in his mind, his state where he was. Now listen, listen to this. He also understood what he couldn't think about, what was impossible for him to think about. And what he couldn't at all think about was rescue. How can he think about getting saved from the desert when he doesn't, didn't know what it was? How can he think of a way to free himself of his condition when there's, there's no knowledge there, no facts, no insight, no consciousness there about what it is? He can't think about that. All he can do is think about where he is now, his present state. Do you understand the depths of this? Are you following it? So he began to think, well, look, if I can't think about rescue, about how to save myself, about solving this enormous problem I have, if I can't think about that, then I might as well give up. Right, absolutely. Why think about it and create a false solution? That's what I've been doing all the time, he said. I thought about rescue. That man who was the leader back in the world said, follow me, I know where there's an oasis there. And I'll lead you to the oasis and we'll all be saved. I thought about rescue, but my lost condition was thinking about it and I went nowhere. How clear this became to him. And this had better become clear to you, too. And we'll cover more of that a little bit later. When he said, there's no point wandering around trying to save myself out here. And he said, I think I'll go back to the airplane. 
He didn't know where rescue was. He didn't know about that helicopter. He didn't know that there had been a plan all along to rescue down planes. He didn't know anything about that. He knew one thing, and you had better know it, that what you're doing is utterly, utterly useless and pointless, and you are wasting your life away. You're wasting your life thinking about rescue. I've told you before, you, you must see absolutely that there's no entity there to rescue, which, by the way, is rescue. And that's another story. So he said, I'll go back to the airplane, simply because it's the right thing to do. The only thing I have left to do, I'm going to stop doing the wrong thing. Let me say that again. I'm going to cease doing the wrong thing, which just drives me crazy. Makes me hopeful for one minute that someone's going to tell me what to do, and then we get caught in a sandstorm and we come back. He went back to the airplane and waited there and ceased to think about the way out, and he was rescued. Because he was right where he should have been, and right where he should have stayed all the time. Because that means you're going to have to give something up, isn't it? You're going to have to give all the ideas you have that you already know the way out or can find some other human being who can do it for you. They can do a thing for you. As a matter of fact, let's see if you can understand this. As a matter of fact, you can't do a single thing for yourself. When you go back to that airplane, you just sit under, under a wing of it in the shade and just wait and see what happens. Don't you imagine any kind of a rescue, a truck coming out into the desert with water or whatever. You sit there without knowing what is going to happen next, which is the cessation, the ending of thought, which is also, if you can follow this, the ending of the belief that there's someone there to be rescued. When you see there's no one there to be rescued, then you're rescued. But now we have to go back to the illustration. That man sat there, and something higher than himself came down and rescued him. He let the rescue come to him. What were the other nine men doing? They were going out searching for the way out, weren't they? Using their, their own intellect, which had these these horrible thoughts about where to go, what to do, uh, I should be the leader, not you. And all, all these men chasing around in their delirium, not, not having any guide to follow, but their own distorted minds trying to go to something, and all they ever could go to was their own minds. You, you sit under the, that airplane wing, not even expectantly. Don't you dare hope for anything. Or you'll get out of that shade and go out into the sun again. You sit there still not thinking what to do, knowing what to do. You stay right where you are. And I will tell you that you will hear the airplane motor come down and the airplane come down and eventually rescue. This is your personal experience now.